For more on the ceasefire talks, let's bring in Muin Rabani with the Centre for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies and co-editor of Jadalia. He joins me now from The Hague. Thanks for getting up early for us. I mean, this talk of optimism for this round of negotiations, we've heard it before, and you argue that it's Netanyahu's plan all along to string things out with more and more conditions without ever intending there to be an agreement. Uh, given these new conditions on the Philadelphia corridor, do you still believe that? Very much so. I mean, it's been clear for months that the Israeli prime minister has absolutely no intention of concluding a ceasefire agreement that includes an actual sustained ceasefire. And this is a position not only of his enemies and rivals, but his own defense minister, even his own negotiators, who he has personally appointed, are now more or less publicly saying the same thing, that the main obstacle is Netanyahu because he does not want to deal. Right. You, you wrote a fascinating uh, long thread on X about all of this, and I, I just want to quote uh, one part of it for people. Quote, Washington's problem is it has consistently declined to use either its influence or power to prevent such escalation, and when it has, this has been ineffective. What then is Washington's role in all of this? Is the US allowing itself to be duped by Netanyahu? I'm not sure I would use the term duped, but I would make the argument that the key obstacle to a ceasefire is neither Israel nor Hamas, but rather Washington, because Washington has the capacity, has the extraordinary leverage to bring this to an end at any moment it chooses. The problem really is that the Biden administration, while it may have objectives that differ from Israel's, is unwilling to use any of its leverage or influence, particularly in the context of a presidential election campaign, um, to actually compel Israel to accept its own deal. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of this is that, of course, with every passing day, the risk of all-out regional uh, conflict increases rapidly. Yeah. Uh, there, there are many, even inside Israel, who, as we've been discussing, think Netanyahu doesn't want a, a, a deal um, for his own political survival to keep his criminal cases at, at bay. But at the same time, quite apart from the carnage in Gaza, settlers have been on the rampage in the West Bank. There's been a massive land grab in terms of new and expanded settlements underway and, and Palestinians being forced from the homes and villages. And you argue it's no coincidence that that's happening as the war continues in Gaza. Yes, and I've compared these months of ceasefire negotiations to the Oslo um, negotiations of the 1990s, kind of indefinite, um, interminable negotiations that never reach an agreement, but that do... Um, uh, fulfill the vital objective of serving as a fig leaf, um, as a diversion from what's actually happening on the ground. And they also serve the purpose of rebuffing uh, pressure to deal with the situation as it actually exists. And I think here the combination of the horrific um, uh, violence being inflicted upon the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, plus this diplomatic process, um, the ceasefire process, is also uh, serving to divert our gaze away from the very serious developments uh, that we're seeing in the West Bank in terms of annexation, settlement expansion, ethnic cleansing, and so on. Yeah, a broader plan, as many think. Uh, so, so short term, you, you mentioned the possibility of regional conflict. Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Iranians have held off their retaliation for the assassinations of senior, senior Hezbollah and Hamas figures in Beirut and Tehran while these negotiations go on. Do you see that retaliation coming if these talks fail yet again? Well, it's, I think um, any answer to that question is going to be purely speculative, but at least um, if we take their statements at face value, the failure to deal with Gaza has now put us in a situation where both Iran and Hezbollah have pledged to um, uh, retaliate directly independently of what happens in the Gaza Strip. So at least in theory, we could have a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip tomorrow morning and still face the risk of, of regional conflict. And I think 
those who have chosen not to use their influence, their power, their leverage to bring this to an end, not only um, for the obvious reasons, but also for these kinds of geopolitical reasons, bear um, the vast majority of responsibility for the developments that may well be unfolding in the coming days and weeks. Yeah, fascinating. I, I wanted to get, uh, squeeze this in. We're almost out of time. But when we talk about this stringing out of things, it has a bigger and more historical aspect too. You mentioned Oslo. I, the, the stringing out, if you will, of the entire so-called peace process, the search for a two-state solution. That's been in discussion for year, decades, and it's gone absolutely nowhere. No, but again, it has served the absolutely vital purpose of diverting us from dealing with what's actually yeah. happening on the ground, which has served to make this um, uh, two-state settlement uh, impossible. Fascinating uh, discussion. I appreciate you getting up early there in The Hague for us. Muin Rabani, thank you so much. Thank you.